I see potential for change. I see a blank slate almost out there. And it's something that we can use to start to combat a lot of the problems that we are currently facing as society on this planet. So that's what I want to talk about. I want to point out that problem and underscore it a little bit more. But then I also want to talk about how we can use our fruit production systems in order to solve some of these really serious problems that we're facing on Earth. All right. So I think that if I distill all of these problems down into a, into a single little bullet point, it's, it's this right here. We're losing biodiversity on this planet. It's not just a bee problem. Sure, we're losing our pollinators, but we're also losing terrestrial vertebrates, things with backbone. We're losing bats, water birds, butterflies, farmland birds, grasslands, coral reefs, mangroves. This is a consistent trend throughout many of the, uh, many of the groups of animals, plants, and other organisms on this planet, and habitats in general. Very serious, right? And a lot of the issues that we're facing, be it climate change, be it pollution, be it so many of these other factors, are all linked back to this biodiversity. A lot of that is tied to how we're producing food. Marla touched on that. But here we see, right here, this is agroecosystems, right? And as agroecosystems have expanded to try to accommodate you know, the growing world population, feed nine billion people, right? It's, a, it's come at the expense of many of the other habitats and many of the other species within the environment. At the end of the day, because agroecosystems occupy so much of a presence on Earth, it is now currently the largest terrestrial biome on the planet. Very important, and if we're not involving agroecosystems and land managers, in how we're conserving biodiversity and how we're treating biodiversity, then we're really losing out on an important opportunity. But what's so fascinating, and you guys heard about this with Carrie Fowler, is that even within our agroecosystems, ecosystems, we're losing diversity. Since 2007, when the ethanol mandates hit, we've seen major land use changes, and even in our crop production. Soybeans stuck around pretty well. This is about 3% more. Land area is planted in soybeans, but wheat is down. Hay is down. Other crops are diminished. But what is increasing? Corn. Corn. It's increased by 14% since 2007, which doesn't sound like a lot until you realize that corn occupies 30% of all crop acres out there. 5% of the terrestrial land surface of our country is this one plant species, and it's genetically very challenged, okay? So, this is, a, this, is a, this is also biodiversity loss. And there's a consequences to that. Here's a pretty little graph. Green is corn, blue is soybeans, and red is cotton. You can see Chicago here. You can see the Mississippi River, the Minnesota River. All of them, this is three plant species, 9% of the terrestrial land surface of our country, all of which are genetically modified, all of which are maintained using chemical fertilizers, herbicides, neonicotinoid pesticides. That's a tremendous footprint. And all of the other life in our country is tied to that footprint. Who cares? Crop land is meant to produce food, right? We don't care about you know, a bunch of bees, a bunch of flowers, and things like that. We're, we're interested in producing food. What we, what we forget is that, and what we, what we seem to repeatedly uh, go through the same motion, is that throughout history, whenever we have tried to replace ecosystem services with technology, Mother Nature has turned around and kicked us in the crotch, right? It's incredible that we, that we think that we can control some of these things that biodiversity provides to us simply by contriving some whiz bang -ism. A good example of this is bugs, and that's what I study. Uh, when I tell people that I'm an entomologist, they explain to me that the only good bug is a dead bug. This is not what I believe. This is not the truth. Right? So we're going to cross that right because when we have this pest-centric mentality towards insects, 
We forget that insects are the most diverse group of animals on planet Earth, and that for every one pest species that's out there, there's 1,700 other species that are actually helping humankind, right? These things are, these things are, uh, these things are doing stuff. I mean, that's incredibly biodiverse, right? They're providing us services. And uh, entomologists estimate that services of insects uh, tally up to around 500 some billion dollars a year, right? Tremendous value, tremendous value. Even within specific habitats, we end up seeing uh, tremendous diversity. So hundreds of species can be maintained within a single habitat. Lots of biodiversity. And it gets to be so complex that really to understand the almost nearly infinite ways that these insects could be interacting with one another, we have to start thinking about things within a network, like within a web. And as you tug on any strand within this web, you realize that it is connected to everything else in that web, right? So say there's a pest right here, it's connected to so many other insects within that web. And we live in that web. And our crops live in that web. So it becomes very important that we understand these connections. <coughs> um, ecologists have tried to do this, but it's extremely difficult, as you may uh, as you may imagine, because as we try to understand how tugging on strands within a web affect the entire network or even a focal species like a pest, it becomes very complex. So we simplify it down. We simplify it down. So here we see a very simplified food web. We've got a corn plant here. This is a primary pest of corn. It's called the European corn borer, and it lives within the stalks. So once it enters in there, it never sees the light of day. So this is a parasitoid wasp. That parasitoid wasp eats the corn rootworm. What it does is it's flying around and it finds in that stalk, without actually seeing it, it rubs its antennae on the stalk until it senses where the corn, the, the corn borer is and it injects its stinger through the corn stalk and lays an egg directly inside the corn borer. That egg hatches and eats the corn borer alive. Very powerful natural enemy, right? Lady beetle larvae, here that looks like a little alligator there. Devastating predator of, other, of, of these insects within cornfields. And these things will even eat each other a little bit, at least the lady beetle will eat the, the wasp. So we see this complex network, and as you start plucking things out, you start to see how things might crumble. But this is what an actual corn food web looks like. This is just the bugs. We actually went into 53 corn farms around eastern South Dakota, and we counted how many different species. So each of these dots is a species, and if it starts to, if its numbers increase, and then its neighbor increases along with it, we draw a line. And you find that if you tug on this one pest right here, that it's connected to so many other things, right? And so it becomes very difficult to understand how this, how this very, very complex biodiversity might fall. Nevertheless, it's important that we know. It's so important that we know. Because these networks do things. And as you start plucking out species, say with insecticides or with our other management decisions, if you pluck out the right ones, you find that that thing will bounce back. But if you pluck out too many, you start to see the whole network crumple down on itself. Here's a great example. So this is that web, that big old hairball you just saw, that big old plate of spaghetti, except they've separated out the major components. And this, we went into cornfields that had very low pest abundance. So what you find is a lot of connectivity, right? These species are interacting with each other. This is a cornfield with high pest abundance. And you see that these are not very resilient webs, right? These are very brittle. They're very fragile. What this says to me is that our decisions are creating our pest problems. When we create a corn agroecosystem, when we create a cornfield that has not a lot of diversity in it and not a lot of interactions, that means that we're producing our own pests. What it also suggests to me is that the pests 
are not the problem. If you have a pest in your field, or on your dog, or in, or in your house, that means the things within that system are out of whack. The pests are a symptom, and they're telling you something about that, about that, about that system, right? So how do we do this? How do we conserve beneficial communities? How do we get the functions of those that biodiversity into our food production systems? Conceptually, it's very simple. You reduce disturbance and you increase diversity. Disturbance is things like tillage. Disturbance is things like pesticide use. And you increase diversity, more species, especially plants. Reducing disturbance. I don't know about you, but this is not where I would want to live. This is what we do in the fall and in the spring. The point of tillage is to kill biology. So we, sit, we, we establish a system. We've killed off a lot of the biology in our soil, and then we come in in the spring and we plant acres and acres and acres of a single plant species. And lo and behold, every year, the first insect to establish is the primary pest of that, of that, of that crop. And the biology that would normally be there to resist its proliferation has been killed. Increasing diversity on farms. How do you get more plants into cropland? Well, there's actually a lot of ways that we know how to do this agronomically that are profitable, that make a lot of sense. In South Dakota, we have a very typical rotation of corn, snow, corn. <laughs> this is not long enough. We need more than that. We need to have a lot more crops in our rotation, in our tool belt. We need to be growing more crops on a single plot of land. We need to be growing more uh, crops on smaller plots within a single farming operation. Cover crops make a lot of ecological sense. You never leave that soil bare. Field margins are not something to be mowed or hayed. They're a tool that farmers can use in order to increase, increase diversity in their farms and, and reduce the input costs that they need for managing their crop. A lot of the problems that we're currently facing on this planet, from human health to environmental health, pollution, climate change, invasive species, are all linked to how we're managing our food. But that means that many of our problems can actually be solved by managing our cropland correctly. 40% of the terrestrial land surface of our planet is agroecosystems. So indeed, if we want to solve these problems, it has to happen within these food production systems. Here's a great example. Cows and climate change. So I'm part of a group of multidisciplinary group of scientists. We're really interested in changing how we're managing herds, right, our cattle. We can produce beef this, in a different way where we load a bunch of cows into a very small area of, of pasture and we let them graze to be heck and they kill a lot of the weeds that are out there and then we move them. We move them very frequently. This patterns similar to the herds that used to move through the plains. The beef is more healthy because it's entirely matured on grass and the pasture after they're done grazing is incredible in the amount of recovery that it does, and it provides so much biodiversity and so much, so many resources to all of the other organisms within that pasture system. What also is coming around, or what we're learning from this, is that plants are sucking the carbon out of the atmosphere at such a rate as a result of this grazing scheme our projections are that if we take and use 20% of the current rangeland uh, in, in the US, we can completely offset our annual carbon emissions from fossil fuels by using our food production systems. We require a transformational shift in food production. Science has demonstrated, I mean, there is no question that if we integrate livestock, perennial crops, and annual crops into a single system, that that is incredibly resilient, that it produces healthier food, and it is more profitable than current production systems. For example, these perennial fruit trees, the apples have a lot of pests, it's a pesticide-intensive crop, 
But as you abandon those and you integrate chickens underneath there, then they consume a lot of the pests associated with that crop, and so you don't need the pesticides anymore. Sunflowers. You've got a lot of bare ground in between those sunflower rows. So what, there's guys down in Kansas that are starting to plant these flowering species. They're taking a honey crop off of that sunflower crop in addition to that original sunflower crop. They're stacking revenue streams. And they're thinking about financial plans, not for this year, but for the next 20 or the next 50 years. Very resilient food production systems. But transformational changes do not come from the government, and they do not come from the university systems. They come from the bottom up. So I guess the other big idea that I would want to put across here is that this is not just a pipe dream. This is not something that I'm, 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 I'm imagining. This is something that farmers are already doing. These guys have abandoned through the use of, their, by focusing on soil health. These are some of my farmer friends. We go out to their farms and do research out there um, from all over the country. And these guys are on the leading edge. They've abandoned a lot of their insecticide inputs. They've abandoned a lot of their fertilizer costs. And they're replacing that with biodiversity that builds their soil. Uh, in preparing this slide, uh, I was asked, I was eating breakfast with Dave Branty, a friend of mine from Ohio, and he, uh, he I, I asked him, Dave, how, when's the last time you, you used insecticides and making a slide, that, and he's like, oh, it's been about six years, except for that 10 acres. I'm like, oh, really, what do you do there? Well, I plant corn with neonicotinoids on it. I'm like, why do you do that? Well, my agronomist said that it'll give me a, it'll give me a six acre bump. I'm like, oh, okay, is that what you saw? He's like, no, I lost about nine, eight, nine, nine bushels on that. Nine bushels. I'm like, why did you do that, kid? He's like, to prove that my agronomist is full of crap. <laughs> year after year after year. <laughs> the question that I have is, where is the science? The farmers, in this case, are leading the science, right? We have a situation where we need to be training our next generation of scientists so that they are not only asking the correct questions, but they're also out there and they're able to communicate these answers to the next generation of farmers in order to help this innovation really take hold. We are on the front edge of a, a tremendous movement in this country that's going to revolutionize how we produce food. Really amazing times. So I look at agriculture as having an incredibly bright future. I believe that we can conserve the environment while producing our food. In fact, the answer isn't whether we can do these two things at once. The answer, the question really is, is whether or not what's going to happen to us if we don't. And part of what gives me such incredible hope is that I get to work with the next generation of scientists that are so enthusiastic and so passionate about this that really we can't lose. The other thing that gives me so much hope is the fact that I've got two kids that need this plant. And, and so I'm going to work the rest, of my, <laughs> the rest of my life to make sure that they have the resources that they need to, ha to have, uh, that they need to, to live a happy and healthy life. So for those reasons, we need to, to really uh, uh, focus on this and, 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 and make this transformation happen. And that, I believe that's all I've got. That is all I've got.